Can we admit that population decline is the worst thing of all time for real estate? What would happen to property prices if homes are empty? How many landlords would go bankrupt if their apartment is half occupied? More on the specter of population decline and what that means for society and real estate with an esteemed guest, the one-time Secretary of Banking and Securities for Pennsylvania, appointed by their governor. Well, Here's a big question that I have for you. At 8.1 billion people today, is Earth overpopulated or underpopulated? Well, there's a lot of very valid points on both sides of that. You know, there are a number of folks who decry the level of population we have because of its destructive impact on the environment. And there's a lot of folks that note that it's population growth that really has made our econo economic growth so vibrant. So there's a real contention on that issue. You know, we tend not to take a position, but what we do note is as world population growth is slowing, which it clearly is, that is going to make economic growth much more challenging in a whole lot of places around the world, some of which are actually starting to see population declines like China. I want to get to that slowing growth in a moment, but you know, we talk about overpopulation versus underpopulation. Some in the overpopulation camp, thinking the world has too many people, they're referred to as Malthusians, named for Thomas Malthus, who in 1798, he said the world would exceed its agricultural carrying capacity and there was going to be mass starvation. Malthus was wrong. He didn't consider technological advancement. So I guess my point is the future can be really difficult to predict. Yeah, without question. You know, the big innovation came in the early 1900s when we figured out how to synthetically manufacture uh, things like fertilizer, which allowed the arable land area to increase dramatically uh, and kind of took the Malthus equation off the table. Yes, with the mechanization of harvesting and the engineering of foods, there sure have been a lot of advancements there to help feed more people. And yeah, Richard, you talk about population decline. Of course, the world population overall is still growing, but its rate of growth is declining. So before we talk about the United States, you mentioned China. China, why don't we discuss population decline more in global terms, where even nations like India are already struggling to exceed the replacement birth rate of 2.1? Yeah, I mean, it's a phenomenon that, you know, we haven't faced or perhaps even thought of for a couple of hundred years because population growth accelerated so dramatically with the Industrial Revolution. We've really not known anything but rapid growth. And Frankly, it's easier to grow businesses and the economy as a whole. But now we're seeing places like China, Japan, Germany that are facing population declines and places like India, which, as you said, is comparatively a younger country, nevertheless facing this prospect as well. In, a, in 1980, the average age in the U.S. was 30. Today, it's 38. In Germany, I believe it's 48. So the world's getting old in a way that it had not previously in the industrial revolutionary period. I think a lot of people are aware that many parts of Europe, Japan, South Korea are in population decline or they're set up for population decline. But yes, some of these other nations that we think of as newer nations or growing nations, including India, are not forecast to grow. And Richard, are we really down? Of course, there are a number of outliers. Are we down mostly to Africa that still have the high birth rates? The world, you know, as the world has become more urban, the need for more kids has declined. Kids in an urban environment become an expense rather than a benefit. So that alone accounts for uh, the deceleration. And then you have folks that are getting married later, having kids later, and you simply can't have as many kids when those two things are true. So it's a combination of events. And there aren't that many places left that have high birth rates. And even in Africa, it's declining or decelerating. So the world's just moving that direction. Yeah, it's really once we see the urbanization trend in a nation, what lags behind that 
are slowing birth rates, oftentimes birth rates that don't even meet death rates in some places. And yeah, it kind of goes back to the Thomas Malthus thing again, if you will. When you don't have a family farm, you don't need nine kids to milk the cows and shuck the corn and everything else like that. You might live in a smaller urban apartment. The world just hasn't been thinking about this issue and it's upon us now and it's going to change everything from governments to handling debts to infrastructure to growth itself. So, you know, we need to start thinking about this issue much more deeply than we have. Is there any way that an economy can grow with a declining population and how bad will it get? Well. An economy will obviously struggle to grow if the population is declining, but the per capita GDP can increase as population declines. And in fact, we might see that early on in a population decline situation. I think that's actually been true in Japan over the last few years. The population is down, but GDP per capita is actually increasing slightly. So. You know, I think it's longer term when you talk about trying to service the debt that we have amassed with a smaller population that we're really going to have issues. Yeah, talk to us more about that, the, the servicing the debt part of a declining population. Well, you know, the debt doesn't shrink on its own. So it tends to grow because, you know, it's accruing interest. It only seems to go one so direction. It only pretty much only goes in one direction. <laughs> So it's pretty simple. If you have growing debt, and I'm talking about public debt and private debt, and you have a declining base to service that, you have more people in retirement who are not having, you're not paying as much in the way of taxes, it's going to increase the challenge. And it may in fact increase it considerably as we look out a few decades. We need productivity to pay down debt. That's more difficult to do in the declining population. We talk about technological advancements, some things that we cannot foresee. Did you sort of lead on to the fact that some of this might help us be more productive, even in a declining population, whether that's machine learning or robotics or AI? What are your thoughts there? Well, you know, that's something that's been predicted for quite some time. You know, if we look back not too far ago, economists were wondering what we were going to do with all of our free time. Right. Because, you know, automate, and this goes back to the 20s and 30s thirties and forties, what we do with all our free time. So we again have conversations along those lines. You know, it's not inconceivable that we could all be sitting there, you know, sipping our Mai Tais and the machines could be doing all the work for us and servicing debt might be easy in that scenario. I doubt it. I don't think that's what's going to happen. The more technology advances, the more complex society gets. That continues to create jobs in places where we can not see them. I mean, case in point, here in the year 2024, we're more technologically advanced than we've ever been in human history, obviously. Yet here in the United States, we have more open jobs than we even do people to fill them. Yeah, and I think one of the things that all of this does is uh, increase the march of inequality. You have folks that master the technology, become engineers, software engineers and the like that are going to be the huge beneficiaries of these trends. You know, the folks that don't have the skill sets aren't going to benefit from these trends. And, you know, even though in aggregate, we may continue to see per capita GDP increase, our track record over the last few decades would suggest that inequality will increase just as markedly as it has in the past. So we'll have some societal issues to face. That's concerning as inflation continues to exacerbate inequality simultaneously, which we'll talk about later. But population decline is of concern to us as real estate investors, because of course we need rent paying tenants. So this could be pretty concerning to some. You've probably seen a lot of the same models that I have, Richard, let me know. In the United States, population is projected to increase for several decades by every single model that I've seen, maybe even until or after the year 2100. Well, we clearly, you know, the projection is by 2050, we'll have about 380 something million people. And today we're at 330 mi something million people. So clearly the population is gonna continue. It's just kind of the relative portion of those populations. And what I think we're seeing, and you as real estate investors would know this better than I, 
is a shift towards the type of real estate out there. Right. So instead of new homeowner development, it's retirement development that I think is going to be the higher growth sector within the real estate industry. And we're surely going to see fewer offices be built, something that may never come back. And then when we talk about things like birth rates and population growth rates here in the real estate world, I sort of think of there as being a lag effect. It's really not so much about today's births in the United States because people often rent their first place in their 20s. And then the average age of a first time home buyer is an all time record high at 36. And all those people are gonna need housing into old age as well. So to me, it's sort of about, oh, well, how many people were born from the 1940s to the 1990s? Well, there's a very useful tool that's pretty easily available called the Population Pyramid. You can find yeah. that on the CIA World Factbook site for every country, including the United States. And it shows exactly what you're talking about, which is the number of folks that, you know, between zero and 10 years old and 10 to 20 years old and so forth. So you can kind of make reasonable projections about the near term based on the data that the CIA World Factbook is kind enough to provide. I believe the UN has this data as well. So you can make informed judgments about the very thing you're talking about here, which is how many folks are in their 20s to over the next 10 years versus the last 10 years. Yeah, it's reassuring to real estate investors to know that we expect several decades of population growth in the United States. However, it may be slow in growth. So we talked about births. I mentioned deaths. Why don't you tell us a bit more about immigration, something else that can be very difficult to project. Here in the real estate world, we have a popular analyst called John Burns Research and Consulting. Their data shows that we had 3.8 million Americans added to our population last year, much of it through immigration. That's a jump of more than 1% an all time record in our 248 year history in one year alone. So can you tell us at least in the United States a bit more about immigration in the calculus for population projections, Richard? Immigration is a huge factor in the demographics of every country. And the US from a pure population growth standpoint has benefited by in migration including illegal in migration. That is a positive comparison versus a lot of countries that are either more restrictive, you know, or aren't as desirable destinations for immigration and the like. So it has benefited us from a pure population standpoint. But what we clearly see is there are cultural ramifications that are difficult for us to deal with. You know, we have uh, the percent of folks that are in the United States that were born in another country is the highest it's been, I think, at least in a century or more, and perhaps ever. That is really difficult for the general population to absorb. You know, we see this in the headlines every day. We see it in the concern. We see it in, uh, you know, the political rhetoric. It's a real issue. So you have a very real conflict between the be economic benefits of immigration versus the cultural divisions that that immigration creates. And that's not gonna be easy to digest or to resolve. You know, I think we probably end up continuing to compromise, but it continues to be a political lightning rod frankly, into the foreseeable future. Yeah, there are so many factors here. Where's our future immigrant diaspora? Is it in places in Latin America like Guatemala and Honduras and Colombia? And are those people going to come from there? So there are a lot of factors, many of which aren't very predictable to take a look at our future population growth rate in the United States. You can watch this one next.